Good afternoon. I'm Jim Hoagland, and we are now in the process of mounting a challenge to uh, the, the general lack of attention that is paid to Latin America. My distinguished predecessor as a columnist, James Reston, once said that the people of the United States would do anything for the people of Latin America except read about them. And I'm afraid that uh, Mr. Reston had a point. But today, with the crisis in Venezuela and uh, the political situation in Brazil driving a lot of new interest coverage and somewhat some fears about the course that Latin America is on, uh, we have a lot of attention being paid more and more. We have uh, four very distinguished panelists to take us through the mysteries of Latin America and to um, bring us out at the end of this conversation uh, with some questions from you uh, to uh, guide us into the future. Our first speaker today is Andreas Rosenthal. He's a senior policy advisor at Chatham House, president of Rosenthal and Associates, former uh, Mexican ambassador to the United Kingdom. And uh, Andreas, take it away. Uh, thanks, uh, Jim. Thank you very much. And thanks to the World Policy Conference for the invitation. Um, Latin America, perhaps, as you started off by saying in the United States, is not something a lot of people used to read about. But I think today, Latin America is very much on the front burner of domestic US policy and also in terms of uh, foreign policy. Uh, whether it's because of uh, issues related to migration or questions relating to economic growth or populist presidents that have been elected in many of our countries uh, as a result of uh, an enormous amount of dissatisfaction by the population uh, of regarding previous administrations, previous governments. Uh, there's an enormous amount of volatility going on, and um, I think that has put Latin America more in the forefront of interest in the U.S., but also in Europe and in the rest of the world. In a, in a very general way, uh, the region, if you count it from Mexico all the way down to uh, the Antarctic, and include the Caribbean, the English-speaking and Spanish-speaking and French-speaking Caribbean, uh, is not doing well. Uh, we're not doing well economically, with very few exceptions. Countries like uh, Brazil and Mexico, the two largest economies in the region, are uh, growing at either minimal rates or, in the case of my country, Mexico, uh, probably towards zero real growth this year. A lot of it is also self-inflicted, so that uh, one cannot put the blame on a global downturn <clears throat> in terms of economic growth the way one could with China or with some of the European countries. Um, if, you, if you remove Venezuela from the equation, because Venezuela's growth is negative and has been negative in, in a very large way for the last uh, few years, uh, we are not moving fast enough to uh, be able to deal with the annual new entrance into the labor market. So in addition to other problems, we have a social problem of young people who can't get a job and many of whom don't study either. And so these so-called ninis, uh, in Spanish, ni trabajan ni estudian, uh, is a very serious problem in, in my country and I think in some of the other countries as well. And another issue which I think has happened and, and is part of the scenario these days is that the region as a whole is retrenching from uh, global and regional affairs. We are looking very much introspectively within our own countries um, as a result of the economic contraction, but also as a loss of interest among voters. Uh, voters today are much more preoccupied with their own pocketbook issues, with uh, issues relating to violence, organized crime, 
the migration issue. And so we are very uh, easily uh, abstaining from a larger participation as we have had in the past on the global scene. And I think this is particularly true of Brazil and Mexico. We both had leadership roles in different issue, on different issues, um, climate change and other issues, and we are now very much uh, on our own. Uh, the president of Mexico, for example, current president of Mexico has been in office for 10 months, hasn't left the country once, didn't go to the G20 summit, didn't go to the UN General Assembly, didn't even go to the Pacific Alliance summit, which is uh, a Mexican creation. Uh, and, and I think this is very indicative of this retrenching um, into, into an introspective world of both economic, political, and social issues. Um, so as a result of all of these factors, I think Latin America is going to be, to use an, a, a British expression, punching below its weight uh, in, in the global, on the global stage at a time when the opportunity to lead, and we've heard a lot during this conference about lack of leadership, the opportunity to lead uh, is very present. Uh, but none of our leaders, none of our domestic leaders, are uh, really willing to take this on. They are much more co concentrated on their own uh, domestic issues. I'll just very quickly go through uh, some of the highlights of countries that are in trouble. Uh, I'll start with Venezuela, where, as you know, because it's been in the headlines a lot, there's a humanitarian crisis, there is a government that's, whose legitimacy is being challenged uh, by uh, another uh, leadership uh, push. Um, you have a, a population that has left Venezuela, about four, four million people are projected to have left Venezuela uh, by the end of next year if things don't change there. Um, you have a Russian-Venezuelan alliance that has uh, entered uh, the picture, which is something that replaces the old Cuba-Russian alliance. So Mr. Maduro and the Venezuelan um, government in power at the moment is being supported basically by Russia. Uh, and, and that is something which obviously upsets the U.S., and so the U.S. decided that as a matter of priority in its foreign policy, it was going to move for regime change in Venezuela. Well, um, two years later, there is no regime change in Venezuela. The U.S. foreign policy has failed miserably, uh, and there is no perspective, as far as I can see, of a change today in what's going on in Venezuela. So, we would probably be faced with a great deal more humanitarian um, tragedies uh, in the coming months. In Ecuador, a more recent issue, uh, you have a president who is being uh, assaulted by public opinion uh, because of a reduction or elimination of subsidies for gasoline. Uh, and he has had to move the capital, his government, from the capital of uh, Ecuador, from Quito to Guayaquil, which is uh, an indication that he's, to some extent, the government has lost control of what's going on in the capital city. Uh, Argentina, we've heard the story before. Argentina has been an up and down roller coaster for most of its history, having been one of the richest countries in the world. Again, defaults on uh, its international obligations. Uh, puts the IMF in a serious problem because of the $55 billion that the IMF has pledged to support Argentina. And there are elections coming up uh, later this month uh, where most probably uh, the current president will be ousted uh, by, again, uh, the Peronist populist movement, um, uh, which will be headed by um, a candidate Fernandez. Uh, Nicaragua, Peru, Haiti. Haiti is another uh, tragedy. Uh, 
again, after the earthquake, after all of the suffering that the Haitian people have had, they've had six presidents in the last two years and they're unable to find a way to govern. And the current president is again also being assaulted in the streets by popular opinion, uh, dramatically demonstrating against him and asking for his resignation. Uh, in Peru, uh, the last four presidents of Peru, three of them are in jail, and one of them had to commit suicide because he was going to be discovered as having been involved in a corruption scandal. Um, Nicaragua, Nicaragua, again, a country that at one point was looked up at because it overthrew a dictatorship, a Somoza dictatorship of many, many years. Uh, now the uh, Sandinistas who took over and ejected the Somoza government are back in the dictatorship mode. Uh, the current president, his wife, run the country. They've now been re-designated uh, and, uh, and there also there is a, a, an economic crisis. So putting those countries on one side and talking about my country and Brazil, and uh, Carlos Ivan will, will be much more uh, detailed on the Brazilian situation, uh, we have this very many of the same problems. We have a problem of tepid growth. Um, we have a rising middle class that demands things from government that government uh, so far has not been able to give. We have corruption scandals. Uh, we have violence uh, in the cities, uh, organized crime, uh, drug trafficking, things which really have permeated our daily lives and which at the end of the day are creating uh, a great deal of, of uh, dissatisfaction by our people. So not a good story, uh, I'm afraid to say. Um, and I know that uh, we'll hear something about what investors believe Latin America still offers. But uh, the fact is that uh, for a Latin American, it's not a good time. Thank you, Andreas. So next we head to Brazil. Maybe we can find a little ray of hope there somehow. Um, I think you may, if good. you look carefully. If you look carefully, Carlos, uh, go ahead. Well, hmm. in recent years, Brazil has been the front page of The Economist, the Christ and Rio flying like a rocket. And then on another issue, that same rocket losing its momentum and, and falling. So what happens between both, both issues and what was actually uh, the mistake behind the economist's analysis? I dare to say so. Uh, Brazil, in the beginning of the first uh, Lula government, that is 2002, was in a very bad uh, fiscal situation. And Lula used his capital to fix that situation. But that was not enough. Brazil benefited enormously from a commodity surge, a surge on prices. And as we say in Brazil, we had a sea for, the sea for an admiral, an admiral sea. Perfect wind, perfect light. Everything was perfect. And for many years, we indulged ourselves into many necessary, justifiable social policies, but that were not so affordable in the long run. Not only that, we insisted on giving power to corporations, meaning the judiciary, uh, people in uh, state-owned enterprises, and all of that meant one thing. Potential deficit was growing. In the beginning, that didn't affect the rate of investment. But after a while, especially after 2008, 2010, 2008 was not bad in Brazil, 2009, the GDP had a fall, 2010, it was an extraordinary year, but composed with 2009, it just meant that we were growing at 3.5%. During all that period, we were growing at 
2% more than Europe per year. Then, with the Dilma government, uh, we started to have a lot of Keynesianists, but they didn't study Keynes correctly. And they started to intervene in the economy. First intervention, try to uh, change the electricity prices. Try to control everything. That didn't work. That created havoc, and the rate of investment started bit by bit falling. At the same time, we had a central bank dominated by people that were hawks, I would say, that had a, a very strong incentive to create a reputation against fighting inflation when the deficit was growing. So instead of focusing on the deficit, we increased the deficit by paying more interest. Well, public debt, which was around 30-something of GDP, is now at around 80% still manageable. By the way, we have but better public finances than the US. We don't have a US Navy. Therefore, we are not the international reserve currency. But if we had, if you lend us your, your Navy, we will be the international currency. So, uh, the disaster manifested itself at full force after the beginning of uh, the second term for Dilma Rousseff, and it was very fast. GDP started falling, the rate of investment fell enormously, there was a lack of trust, and Dilma was actually impeached after two years of her second term for disobeying the fiscal laws. Something that I've never heard happen in Europe or the US. Merkel was judged by the Supreme Court in Germany, the secretary of the Supreme Court in Germany for something similar to what Dilma did because when she saved the German banks from, the Gre uh, Greek de from Greece's disaster. But Dilma was judged by Congress and she lost uh, her position. The vice president entered, as our constitution uh, mandates, and immediately he started a series of reforms. Those reforms, the most important of which would have been the change in social security, were stalled after there were, were accusations that he was involved in a corruption scandal. He went to meet a businessman in the garage of the presidential palace, and from that moment on, Brazil uh, lost governance. With the election of a new president, we started a new period and we went for recovering the work on social reform. And we are almost there, thanks to a, a good interaction between the president and Congress. Congress in Brazil, and this is ignored by many outside, is very strong right now. It is very po powerful. The president has, uh, there was a law concerning the abuse of power from magistrates, from judges, uh, enacted by the Congress. And the president vetoed 45 items. 30, 20, 33 of those items, the veto was canceled by Congress. So, Power is divided, and this is very important because we belong to the average Latin American class that started their independence drinking from the French Enlightenment. So, as in France, we had our candidates to be Napoleons, to be uh, Napoleons the Third, to be to be Thiers, to be Clemenceau's, to be De Gaulle's. We always have this demand for a strong man. And of course, uh, Britain did have better credit at the time of Waterloo and could mobilize more people because the decision on the debt 
was taken by Parliament. This is a deep and profound move that is happening now in Brazil. And for investors, this is extremely important. Next year, the budget is going to be mandatory. Something that foreigners never guess is that we don't have a mandatory budget. The budget, if I say in the budget up to this year, if I say I'm going to spend $100 billion in education, if I decide I'm the president, I decide to spend 50, it's okay. Of course, the policy that I will, would develop with 100 billion is different from the policy that I would develop, that I will develop with 50 billion. So the president has to remain this power, and this power has been reduced. So don't expect to end, don't expect Brazil to fix everything at once, but we are moving into the right direction. Disposable income has grown 1.7% on average, in Rio 4% in the last year, up to June. And this is a good sign. Uh, we expect better growth next year. It will take us three, four years to recover full growth, but it is possible, provided we continue to stress on the reforms. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, an old friend of the WPC and of many of us here, uh, Miguel Angel Moratinos, the former foreign minister of Spain. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, giving me this opportunity to talk to this important issue. Uh, let me say two preliminary remarks. Number one, that being a Spaniard, I really ask uh, to my Latin American friends to be condescended with me because in <laughs> Spaniard we have a long interest, moving interest. So we do with a, a lot of political and historical element, but uh, sometimes as the former, uh, you know, colony, I mean, we are not very well understood, number one. Number two, I will try to be not ideological. I will try to identify the challenges of uh, Latin America today, uh, either you are from the left or this so-called populist, on the left, on the right, and trying to be, trying to be objective to identify the challenge of Latin America today, from a Spanish point of view, and from an analyst international point of view. I will start by commanding the World Policy Conference to convey this uh, Latin American debate. It, it was an unusual, even there is not too many people. Well, thank you for being here with us, you know. <laughs> but there was a reason. Ten years ago, nobody will care about Latin America. It was not in the agenda <coughs> because the situation was going quite well. Latin America was growing in 5% average. There was no military putsch, no military coup. There was some uh, success story in Salvador, even at the end of the day, in, even in Colombia, the, the guerrilla went to the democratic processes. Even after the financial crisis in Europe, in Spain, and my compatriots, uh, they was queuing in the Brazilian uh, consulate because uh, Brazil was asking visa. So the new architect, engineer, was uh, rushing to go to Brazil, to Peru, uh, going out of the crisis in Europe. I was going to Latin America, and they received me. Oh, oh uh, Spanish foreign minister, you have problems, eh? Hmm? You are in a bad situation, no? We are uh, now. So they didn't make headlines. But today I will give you three main headlines. Number one, a statement of the candidate of Argentina that the polls say that is going to win the election in Argentina, Alberto Fernandez. <laughs> he said, the main problem of Argentina is the hunger. Can you understand? The most important country in agricultural production cannot feed his citizens? The hunger. Second headline. President Macron or President Bolsonaro, Amazon. 
what is going on in the environment framework. And what Amazon means is for the biodiversity for whole, of course, Brazil, but for the whole international community. And what it means for the Latin America economy, not only the Amazon, but in Bolivia, the forest, and the raw material, the environment, the nature, because the Latin American economy has been during the last uh, four decades or even more depending only on raw materials. Third headline, Ecuador, my friend eh, Rosenthal mentioned. Indigenous people taking over Quito capital. Who could imagine five years ago, or three years ago, that Quito will be, you know, invaded and trying to be uprooted from indigenous community to try to overthrow the regime. Three headlines that reflect the three main challenges of Latin America. And I will try to be brief. Number one, the economy. Either populists on the right or populists on the left. There has been no a serious economic policy in the majority of the Latin, Latin American country. There has been a low productivity. Today, the figures you mentioned, they are growing at 0 0.5. Even Brazil, imagine Brazil, 0 0.8. Argentina, not only 0 0.9. Mexico, zero. And they are producer of the most important natural resources that combine and facilitate the economy of the international trade. No fiscal reform. You know what is the, the pressure of fiscal reform in Latin America? The average 10%. In Germany, 40%. In Spain, 38 In Sweden, 50 they don't pay taxes. They have not been introducing this fiscal reform. From the left to the Bolivarian and whatever, to Macri or to any government has been in Latin America. So the economic reform should be addressed. Number two challenge, the environment, as I say. The Amazon is the symbol. What they are going to do with these resources? They can continue with this uh, extractive production? I mean, uh, in Bolivia, they have lithium, they have gold, they have oil. Uh, well, okay, it's only agricultural product, natural resources, and how they are going to maintain and satisfy the sustainability agenda, the SDG agenda. They have to address this issue. And third challenge is the political and social challenge, the most important one. And that is the reason why today we have a still people in the street of Quito. And there have been many success stories, but one that, of course, is not so popular is Bolivia. Then we can discuss, maybe by people around me that were against my position. But can you run, run, rule a country? I put the example of Bolivia, where 60% of the population, 60% are indigenous. And that till 2003 and 2004, is only 15 years ago, they were not citizens. They didn't participate in the political life. They didn't vote. They were absolutely outside the political system. And Evo Morales introduced them and succeeded to get them into the new reality. And today Bolivia is growing at 4%. And we have a very nice uh, and positive economic uh, situation. I don't know if it's going to win the election. I don't know. So you cannot avoid to take into account the social elements of uh, Latin American countries. Uh, with all my respect to my Brazilian friend, 
of course you have elite. You have the economic, uh, you know, uh, class. Uh, but if you don't address the situation in the social poor areas of uh, Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, people will revolt. People will not accept. And that is one of the main concerns. What is happening, and I finish, in Argentina? Why after the collapse of the Kirchner, was a disaster of Kirchner? Okay, everybody know how much uh, uh, problem were caused by them, but then everybody was expecting that Macri will be the magic formula, neoliberalism and back, and he failed again. So the three challenges have to be addressed together the economic, the environmental, and the social and political reform. Miguel, thank you for that very forceful and clear presentation. And uh, our last speaker uh, is uh, Bertram uh, Badre, who is former managing director uh, of the World Bank and today heads an investment firm whose name is Blue Like an Orange. So it sounds like we can expect some optimism from Bertrand. Merci. Euh, je vais parler en français pour une fois. C'est un luxe rare et apprécié. Euh, il me revient le rôle compliqué après tout ce qu'on a entendu. Heureusement que Carlos a donné une petite note plus positive sur le Brésil, euh, d'expliquer pourquoi, si j'entends tout ce que j'ai entendu à ma gauche, il reste une bonne idée d'investir en Amérique latine aujourd'hui. Euh, alors, une fois que j'ai dit ça, <rire> silence. Mais fondamentalement, euh, c'est bien ça que j'ai choisi de faire en quittant la Banque mondiale. Euh, en partenariat avec la Banque interaméricaine de développement, nous avons créé Blue Like an Orange, en hommage à Paul Éluard, la terre est bleue comme une orange, Earth is Blue Like an Orange, euh, pour nous attaquer aux questions qui ont été soulevées par mon voisin, qui est, le monde en 2015 a pris un certain nombre d'engagements sur le développement durable et le climat, et une bonne partie de ces engagements seront gagnés ou perdus à l'échelle de la planète, notamment en Afrique et en Amérique latine. Et donc j'ai choisi de commencer en Amérique latine parce que c'est un continent où il y a beaucoup d'opportunités. Alors je me souviens très bien de ce que m'avait dit Luis Alberto Moreno, le président de la Banque Interamericaine, il y a deux ans. D'ailleurs, je l'avais réuni devant mes possibles investisseurs. Il avait commencé en disant « Latin America is great, but there is a footnote. It's not for beginners. » And that's exactly the point quand on a entendu tout ça. Donc c'est vrai que quand on regarde le continent dans son ensemble, 2019, ce n'est pas une très bonne année. Ce n'est pas une très bonne année parce que la croissance est affaissée au Mexique, qu'elle reprend à peine au Brésil, et on peut prendre pays par pays, on peut effectivement dire que ça ne va pas. Et au niveau de l'ensemble du continent, qui est en plus tiré vers le bas par le Venezuela, qui pèse beaucoup sur le, la croissance macro du continent, on est juste au-dessus de zéro. Les dernières estimations du FMI pour cette année même s'il anticipe un rebond l'année prochaine, tiré notamment euh, par le Brésil. Donc vision macro, pas très, pas très enthousiasmante. Vision politique, un peu, un peu compliquée, comme la plupart des gens passent assez peu de temps à comprendre l'Amérique latine, ils lisent le journal, et ils disent la capitale de, de l'Équateur a été transférée de Quito à Guayaquil, ils lisent les élections primaires en Argentine, ils disent, ben oui, on croyait que Macri c'était Macron, et en fait pas du tout. Euh, ils regardent euh, les disputes entre Bolsonaro et Macron et ils disent « Ah là là, alors le Brésil, euh, on n'y arrivera pas » et je peux continuer la liste. Ou le fait que le président du Mexique, effectivement, ne soit pas encore sorti du Mexique. Donc tout ça, on peut, on peut, dire, on peut regarder et se dire bah, « Le verre, il est plutôt euh, à moitié vide qu'à moitié plein. » euh, Et il faut avoir ça à l'esprit. Mais en même temps et c'est mon job, je pense qu'il est en réalité plutôt à moitié plein qu'à moitié vide. Alors à la fois parce que 2009, c'est un moment où on prend une photo, mais que c'est une photo qui vient quand même après 20 ans de, de progrès et de changement. Ça a été rappelé, depuis 20 ans, euh, il y a de la croissance, le revenu par habitant a augmenté, il y a un développement des classes moyennes, de la société civile, des institutions. Effectivement, il y a trois présidents euh, péruviens qui sont en prison, mais enfin, s'ils sont en prison, c'est que le système judiciaire fonctionne. Ce qui est plutôt positif. Enfin, ce n'est pas ce qu'on aurait eu il y a 25 ou 30 ans. Et on peut reprendre le cas du Brésil, etc. Donc il y a, il y a des institutions qui tiennent la route, il y a une société civile qui, qui bouge. Et donc tout ça, tout ça est, un, est un facteur de confort. 
les progrès économiques depuis 20 ans ne s'arrêtent pas du jour au lendemain. On n'est pas au bord d'une falaise où le système s'effondre. On est à un moment d'ajustement où, effectivement, la fin du cycle des matières premières, les tensions commerciales pèsent plus sur l'Amérique latine que sur la plupart des autres continents. Et ça, il ne faut, faut pas le nier. Mais en même temps, c'est le moment où le Mexique devient le premier partenaire commercial américain devant la Chine. Et l'intégration Mexique-Amérique, enfin États-Unis, pardon, est un facteur qui, est profond, qui montre le travail qui a été fait par le Mexique dans l'intégration des chaînes de valeur depuis 20 ans et qui maintenant fonctionne. Ce qui fait que je suis plutôt optimiste sur le Mexique parce qu'il n'y a plus aucune chance. C'est maintenant too big to fail pour les États-Unis. Plus compliqué pour le Brésil. Donc, vous voyez, on peut, on peut, on peut regarder tout ça. Et surtout, et, et c'est pour moi, je, je vais essayer de ne pas être trop long qu'on puisse répondre aux questions, et je ne reviendrai pas dans le détail des pays, mais c'est surtout, ça illustre euh, un, un sujet qu'on peut retrouver d'ailleurs avec des échos en Afrique, où pour les gens, quand ils regardent l'Amérique latine, c'est un ensemble, comme l'Afrique est un ensemble. On dit les marchés émergents, et après, quand on est un peu plus spécialisé, on dit, bah, oui, il y a l'Asie émergente, il y a euh, l'Afrique la, la, et l'Amérique latine, et c'est en partie... Euh, ça fait en partie du sens parce qu'il n'y a aucun des marchés euh, financiers latino-américains individuels qui est à l'échelle de la planète. Donc c'est vrai qu'on raisonne en allocation Amérique latine et qu'on regarde assez peu dans le détail. Et encore une fois, c'est le même sujet qu'en Afrique. On oublie que l'Afrique, c'est 55 pays et que l'Amérique latine, c'est 32 pays. Donc il faut regarder dans le détail. Ce n'est pas parce qu'il y a un problème à Quito qu'il y a un problème à Bogota, etc. Donc effectivement, je reviens à ce que disait Luis Alberto Moreno, ce n'est pas pour les débutants. Donc il faut être sélectif. Et, et les conversations, je, je, je finirai peut-être là-dessus, sur, sur deux points, les conversations que j'ai pu avoir cette année en allant discuter de projets au Brésil, au Mexique ou ailleurs, ben c'est que ce n'est pas parce que le, la croissance du Mexique est de 0% que tout le monde est à 0%. Ça veut dire qu'il y a du plus 5 et du moins 5. Et ça veut dire qu'on peut aller sur le plus 5. Moi, j'ai découvert au Mexique, et je le dis avec humilité, parce que j'aurais dû le savoir avant, qu'il y a un boom dans les technologies à Guadalajara, par exemple. Il y a des entrepreneurs, je suis allé les voir, qui ont signé des accords avec les Israéliens et qui font des choses absolument exceptionnelles. Donc, Brésil, pareil, dans la, dans la fintech au Brésil, etc. Je peux prendre des exemples partout. Donc, il faut se désengager cette vision un peu misérabiliste, macro, sur le thème « ça va pas », etc., qui, qui est exacte, mais qui ne représente qu'un qu reflet d'un certain nombre de choses qui se passent dessous. Et puis par ailleurs, et c'est ce que vous venez de dire, un des enjeux majeurs du continent, et je pense que ça va se voir de plus en plus, alors malheureusement de manière un peu désagréable cet été sur l'Amazonie, c'est que c'est sur la question du climat comme sur la question de la biodiversité et de la nature qui vont être au sommet des, des négociations internationales en 2020, c'est en Amérique latine que ça joue. Entre 40 et 50 de la biodiversité mondiale est en Amérique latine. On a bien vu sur l'Amazonie l'absorption du carbone on a dit que c'était le poumon de l'humanité. Alors après, on dit non, c'est le poumon du Brésil, alors une question de souveraineté. N'empêche que ça va être au cœur des sujets. Et donc d'investir, comme j'essaye de le faire, sur ces sujets de développement durable dans le continent où, où va se gagner ou se perdre ce combat, je pense que ça fait plus de sens que jamais. Et il y a bien de la valeur, non seulement morale, éthique, alors j'en suis convaincu, économique. Voilà. Merci, Bertrand. Euh, nous avons 12 minutes pour les questions très précises, très courtes. Uh, est très clair. Uh, Jean-Louis Jagarin. Il y a des questions, questions purement euh, factuelles. Euh, que, sur l'aspect la, sur géopolitique euh, sur la, de, pour l'Amérique latine, quelle stratégie chinoise, quelle est la stratégie chinoise en Amérique latine euh, Vous avez dit que euh, les Russes soutenaient à fond les Vénézuéliens, les Chinois aussi, ils ont... Ils ont des intérêts économiques et il y a quand même une stratégie un peu concertée de ce côté-là. Deuxième question, la bombe à retardement de l'immigration. Il y a plusieurs scénarios, mais comment ça, il y a quand même le verrou américain, le verrou Trump est en train de fonctionner. Si, le, si Trump est réélu, il sera évidemment maintenu ou renforcé. Quelles sont les conséquences, notamment pour, pour l'Amérique centrale et pour le Mexique Anyone want to? Well, maybe Andreas. maybe I can uh, talk about the Mexico. Well, by the way, I agree entirely with Bertrand. <coughs> uh, in spite of the fact that I'm negative about the region as a whole today, as compared perhaps to some years ago, uh, I still think that Latin America has uh, the potential. And certainly in the case of my country, of Mexico, Uh, as he very rightly pointed out, it is still a, a, 
a favorite destination for investment, uh, both domestic and foreign. Uh, and I don't uh, mean, I didn't mean to be negative about where we're going in the future. It's just that everything has combined this year to be somewhat negative. Uh, to, answer, to answer the question about migration and, and Mr. Trump, uh, it is true that Mexico has had to deal with a, an ever-growing anti-immigrant sentiment in the United States, where uh, the current administration is trying as hard as it can to avoid taking in immigrants, whether they are economic migrants or asylum seekers uh, from Central America. And that has uh, had an immediate effect on Mexico because uh, most of these people uh, who have traveled, in some cases, all the way from Africa to try to get to the United States are stuck in Mexico. And uh, they're stuck in Mexico at the northern border on the Mexican side, which is not the best place to be. It's an area of uh, violence. It's an area of, of uh, organized crime uh, presence. And at the end of the day, the Mexican government having to face this very new phenomenon is not, was not and is not prepared for it. Um, we follow the humanitarian uh, process in terms of our international commitments and try to deal with the people, but it's very difficult when you have right now about 80,000 uh, Central Americans, Africans, Asians who have all come and spent a lot of money and uh, in some cases risked their lives to get to the border to try to get into the United States with an American government that is doing absolutely everything it can uh, to avoid uh, having them come in. Most of these uh, decisions by the Trump administration are under judicial review and it's very possible that at the end many of them will be declared either unconstitutional or they will have to be reversed. But for the time being, it's a major, major problem. And uh, on, the, on the other issue, I think uh, at the end of the day, you have this great variety. And, uh, you know, we, uh, Moratino spoke about uh, Latin America uh, and, and the, the, French, the French influence on Latin America. I've, I've said now for a number of years that the notion of l'Amérique latine is a purely fictional uh, thing that were, was invented by the French to try to have a political, social, legal, and other influence in a region where uh, Spain left at some point and uh, France decided that it wanted to have some sort of a hegemony there. And so l'Amérique latine was born. There is no Am Am Latin America. Latin America is divided, as is Europe and as is Africa. And it's to some extent unfair to try to categorize and compartmentalize Latin America as a single entity. You asked about the Chine. You asked about the Chine. The Chine has two great objectives. The first principal objective is to have access to the matter première. It's primordial for the Chine. Et ça, elle continue. Et en même temps, deuxième objectif, c'est se placer où les États-Unis quittent et faire de l'influence pour contrecarrer la politique des États-Unis qui avait, à un moment donné, été très hégémonique. Les États-Unis, depuis quelques années, sauf le Mexique, évidemment, parce que c'est les voisins, n'a pas été objet d'une stratégie profonde du département d'État. Je me rappelle à mes discussions avec euh, aussi bien Colin Powell, Hillary Clinton, je discutais « Quelle est votre position sur l'Amérique latine ?» Or, sur l'Amérique centrale, évidemment, or, sur le Brésil, or, sur... Ils n'en avaient pas. Et à mon avis, ils n'en ont pas encore. Sauf, Mais, sauf dans le cas de Cuba et Venezuela. Oui, oui bien sûr, le cas de Cuba et Venezuela, et, et le, le résultat, et, et on voit quel est le résultat. Alors, pour vous dire, matière première et remplacement et présence où les États-Unis ne sont pas présents. Et j'ajouterais Mais... récupérer euh, l'argent qu'on lui doit 
des pays d'Amérique latine qui ont vendu tout ça avec du crédit. Dans le cas du Venezuela, ça fait 50 milliards de dollars qu'ils doivent, les Vénézuéliens, aux, Ch aux Chinois. C'est beaucoup. Carlos Si j'ai bien compris, euh, votre question a été où est-ce que les Chinois vont cibler Ils vont cibler sur l'industrie automobile, ils vont cibler sur la réconsolidation des systèmes d'énergie de l'Amérique du Sud. Là, ce sont leurs deux plus grands leitmotifs en Amérique du Sud. Et deux Européens, malheureusement, ils sont propriétaires d'une grosse partie de l'industrie automobiliste de l'Amérique du Sud, mais ils naviguent dans des rêves. Ils ne sont pas en train de payer attention que le Mercosur n'est pas la communauté européenne. Le Mercosur est une union entre quatre peut-être cinq, mais quatre à ce moment pays, qui, dont, qui a la caractéristique d'avoir une Germanie qui est 70% du GNP. Euh, autrefois, euh, si vous considérez le GNP du Brésil, euh, en termes de taux d'échange, c'est 2 trillions, 2 000 milliards de dollars. En termes de PPP, selon le IMF, c'est 3,1 milliards de dollars. 65 de ce GNP, ce sont des services. Qu'est-ce que les Chinois font maintenant Ils achètent des petites, euh, taille moyenne, disons, banques d'investissement pour avoir leur liste de clients. Ils ne payent n'importe quel prix. Ils veulent pénétrer dans les entreprises moyennes brésiliennes pour augmenter le, euh, le, le commerce, pour augmenter les exportations soit chinoise, soit brésilienne. Ça, c'est le, le, vrai, le vrai positionnement. Et finalement, c'est vrai, euh, je suis tout à fait d'accord avec euh, l'ambassadeur Rosenthal, euh, l'Amérique latine est née de deux rêves. Un rêve était le, le rêve Hab, habsbourgien suivi par les Bourbons. Euh, L'autre, c'était le rêve euh, plantagenette de la maison d'Avis. Il ne faut pas oublier que ce sont deux rêves différents. Une, c'est une vision atlanticiste, l'autre, c'est une vision plutôt européenne, continentale. Ce sont deux origines qu'il faut le mettre d'accord. Il faut approcher le Brésil et les autres nations de l'Amérique latine. Pour ça, le Mexique est fondamental parce que le Mexique est plus proche, disons, pas physiquement, mais plus proche dans les idées. Mais mais il y a des profondes séparations culturelles, mais il y a aussi beaucoup d'amitié. Merci, ce Carlos. Est, ce qui est assez amusant euh, avec ce que Carlos Ivan vient de dire, c'est que pendant des années et des années, depuis qu'on a signé l'ALENA avec les États-Unis et le Canada, le Brésil, le gouvernement du Brésil, nous a dit le Mexique ne fait plus partie de l'Amérique latine. Le Mexique a vendu son âme aux États-Unis. Aujourd'hui, M. Bolsonaro fait que ça, vendre son âme aux États-Unis. <rire> Nous avons une question ici. C'est vrai. À Trump. Bon, à Trump. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Carlos, uh, my question is the implication of FTA between EU and the Mercosur countries. In the last 20 years, a lot of discussion and negotiations were done, but uh, you didn't get any solution as to F FTA with EU. But suddenly, uh, you, uh, between EU and the Mercosur countries, you are now having the framework of FTA. So uh, intention of EU side, uh, I think, uh, lies the, the stopping the deforestation of Amazon area. So your government will accept uh, the FTA uh, from such kind of framework. And we have about a minute left. So if it's one minute, I will say, But I will answer you, Professor Tanaka. 
uh, afterwards. But uh, I will give you a longer answer. But the short answer is uh, both Europe and Brazil and even the US are under the same stress. The rise of innovation in Asia is displacing downwards the middle class in all these regions. Of course, our middle class is poorer than European middle class, it's poorer than American middle class, but the phenomenon is the same. So it's, it's a simple fiscality problem. Right. Uh, their, their taxation on GDP is smaller than ours. So, therefore, there is less money for innovation. If they raise the rhythm of innovation, the relative rhythm of innovation falls. And that what is important is a relative rhythm of innovation. So, we have natural resources, but we export planes everywhere, and you must have flown Embraer in the US or Europe and the Middle East. We dig oil 7,000 meters under, under the level of the ocean. We have many industries, and we are suffering this impact. And of course, unless we have to, uh, we want to have uh, pizza delivery a, a speciality in Brazil for, for the service sector, which will mean everyone will be very poor, we have to go after innovation. This is, uh, this is a trick. So trade agreements are necessary. Of course, they are difficult. This is my answer. We will, we, it is on our best interest to preserve Amazonia despite of any other foreign influence. We depend on that for biotechnology, we depend on that for water, for ag agriculture, and so forth. So there is a lot of things that have to be understood, and the problems are not as simple as they seem. I want to thank the panel for expanding my knowledge of Latin America exponentially. And I want to thank the audience for hanging in there to the bitter end. Uh, you're all hardcore, I can tell. Thank you so much.